How bad is false color really? You know, I get this question all the time, especially from beginners trying to decide if a refractor is right for them. They read about this online that refractors have false color and they keep asking me, well, is this gonna bother me or not? I'm gonna to try to answer that question today and help you out. So what is false color? Well, send light through any piece of glass and it's going to refract the different colors a little bit differently. If you were in science classroom as a kid and played with a prism, you had the sunlight come through it and it puts a nice rainbow up on the wall. That's pretty enough to watch, but if you think about it, that's the last thing you want in a telescope. So false color is most commonly seen as a blue or purplish halo around bright objects like the limb of the moon or a bright star. As you get better at seeing this, you will also notice that the stars, which should be white, start to take on a brownish, yellowish, orange tint, depending on how good the color correction is on that particular telescope. So they have this thing called an acromat. And in an acromat, there are two dissimilar pieces of glass shaped a certain way, put them together in a certain way, and it will reduce the false color to acceptable levels. What is the definition of acceptable levels? Well, here is a commonly quoted chart that you'll see, and you'll notice that the higher the aperture, the faster the telescope, the worse the false color. And the idea behind this chart is to try to stay within the green area. Now, acromat means without color. And I think when they invented that term, they probably thought that was gonna last forever. But of course, in the past 20 years or so, we've seen the rise of the apochromat. That actually means the same word, except I think they mean it's much more serious this time. Apochromats are wonderful telescopes, color-free, not only in the visible spectrum, but for outside the visible spectrum as well. And that's why they're used so often for astrophotography. So as far as how bad is false color, well, I can't really answer that because everybody's eye-brain system is a little bit different. What I see is going to be a little bit different from what you see. And it's also dependent upon your experience level. Beginners very often say, you know, they can't see false color. And when you teach them to see it, they'll say very often, well, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> well, the problem is over time, as you get better at this, it's gonna to start to bother you. And I said this before, as you go on in time, your experience level and your expectations do change. They go up or they go down. And the hint, they usually don't go down. <laughs> so here we have three different levels of telescopes at three different price points and three different levels of color correction. Here we have the venerable Orion Short Tube 80, one of the most popular telescopes ever made. I have a friend who says they made about a bazillion of these. And if that's the case, I think I've owned probably about half of them. <laughs> so it's an 80 millimeter F5 Acromat. It doesn't make any pretenses about being a super well-corrected telescope. In fact, if you go back to the chart I showed you before, it's almost in the red area, an unacceptable amount of false color. I actually kind of like that philosophy. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. Sure, why not? You used to be able to get these things for around $125 to $150. Got some inflation going on right here, right now. These are around $200 to $225 for the optical tube alone. Now in the middle here, we have a Teleview Ranger. I have a full review of this. I'll link that below if you want to take a look. This they described as a semi-apochromat, which is a strange term if you think about it. I mean, it's either without color or it's not without color, but it's actually a pretty good description. It's got better color correction than the acromat, but not quite as good as the apochromat. These sold for around $725 towards the end of their production run in the 1990s. Today, you can pick one up for $300 to $350 used, depending on its condition and what it comes with. So on the end here, we have a pure apochromat. This is a Takahashi FS60. You've seen me talk about this on this channel before. This is my favorite astrophotography telescope of all time. I use it more than any others, and I have an FS102, I have a Sky 90, and I have an astrophysics stowaway. I still use this one more than any of the others. As far as the price goes, it's around $1,000 for the optical tube, but if you've ever shopped for a Takahashi, you know buying the optical tube is just the start of you spending 
lots of money. <laughs> so everything is non-standard on this thing from the, sorry, the clamshell ring to the adapters and rings and plates and little machine parts. They all cost a lot of money. By the time you get done outfitting this thing the way you want to see it outfitted, especially with the all-important field flattener here, don't be surprised if you spent twice that $1,000. So again, it's going to be very difficult for me to show you what you see through a telescope because our eye-brain systems are different and because our experience levels and expectations are different. But we do have something that may be a little bit more objective that can teach us this, and that device is called a camera. <laughs> so this is my Hutec modded 5D Mark III. It has been modded for astrophotography, and I mounted that on the back of all three of these telescopes and took some images so we can take a look at this. Now, I do want to stress this is not a scientific test, far from it. In fact, I tried to keep everything constant as long as I could, but that went out the window pretty fast. The images coming straight out of the camera from all three of these telescopes were vastly different. So I wound up doing colors and curves and levels completely differently, almost right off the bat. But it's more objective than the naked eye. I also want to point out that the reason this is not a scientific test is the Takahashi FS60 comes with its own dedicated field flattener. This is enormous, adding to its already considerable advantage over the other two telescopes. The other two telescopes are inch and a quarter only. I can tell you they won't even come close to filling the frame of this full frame sensor. But this one will do it. It's quite remarkable and I'll show you. So let's take a look at some raw screen captures from images straight out of the camera. Now I found when I do this, it's usually instructive to start with the good one first and work your way down. It's easier to see differences that way. So this is the FS60 on M31, and as you can tell, there really isn't much here to talk about. <laughs> Stars are sharp, there's lots of them, and especially look at the corners. There's really nothing there. They're sharp all the way out to the edges, and there's only very minor light drop off towards the edges. Again, this is a remarkable achievement for a telescope with such a small aperture. Moving down to the Teleview Ranger, we can see, of course, that it does not fill the frame of a full frame sensor. The edges are darkened out. This is expected. But if you look at what the Ranger does, it's sharp all the way out, even towards the transitionary area between the light and the dark. Uh, but you are starting to see, if you've got a good screen, some of the brighter stars are a little bit blue. Moving on to the Short Tube 80, this gives us more to talk about still, and that's not a good sign. You can see that, again, the edges are darkened, the stars are bluer than they were with the Teleview Ranger, but perhaps most significantly, look at how much distortion that is. Look on the left-hand side there. Those stars aren't even close to being points. They are long lines. And if you follow from the top left corner into the center, the distortion kind of continues almost all the way to the center. So almost no matter how much you crop this thing out, there's going to be distortion near the edges of whatever frame you, co you crop out. Not only that, if you look, the distortion is much worse on the left side of the frame than it is on the right side of the frame, indicating that my short tube 80 is out of collimation. This is not a huge problem at this price level. I would say almost every short tube 80 that I've looked at has some degree of miscollimation. All right, so let's take a look at some images processed and stacked in PixInsight. Let's start with the FS60, and we'll start with an image that contains mainly stars. This is the double cluster in Perseus, and again, you'll see there's very little to talk about. I was able to use almost the entire frame, and not only that, there are a lot of stars there. They are small, and there are no purple halos around any of them. Notice how white the stars are. Moving down to the Teleview Ranger, again, this is pretty good. If I hadn't shown you the FS60's images, this might be considered a very good image. But again, if you look closely, you can start to see little blue halos around the brighter objects. Notice the stars are a little bit bigger and there are slightly fewer of them. Moving down to the short tube 80, you can see that things are, wow, they're getting pretty blue there. And again, you can see even though I've cropped it out, you can see the distortion in the upper left-hand part of the image. Here is the Pac-Man Nebula, NGC 281. 
the FS60, as you can see, nice and clean. Stars are white. There are lots of them, and they are quite small. Moving down to the Teleview Ranger, and you know something? Rangers and Prontos have problems with this object. I've noticed this before. It just doesn't like taking pictures of the Pac-Man. You can start to see blue halos around the brighter objects, and it's starting to get a little bit annoying. Moving down to the short tube 80, you can see, of course, things start getting very blue, not just in stars, but things are just kind of blue in general. And again, you can start to see the distortion on the left side of the image. Here's the Andromeda Galaxy M31. Again, Takahashi looks good, sharp all the way out to the edges. Stars are small, stars are white. The Ranger looks pretty good also. It's a little bit better than it was on the Pac-Man Nebula, but again, you can see purple halos around the brighter objects. Moving down to the short tube 80, we can see that everything gets just a little bit worse. So what do I think? Really, I think all three of these are good performers at their price points. If you have the money, go for the Takahashi. If all you can afford is, is a short tube 80, by all means, go for it. You know, if there's one surprise that I have in all of this, it's how well this little cheap refractor performed. And I use this thing all the time. I bring it to star parties, I teach people on it, and beginners, you know, you show them the Pleiades or the Orion Nebula or the moon through this thing, they are thrilled. There's nothing wrong with this telescope. If this is all you can afford, by all means, go for it. Also, people have pointed out that if you're good in Photoshop, if you're good in PixInsight, you can do little tricks like masking off the stars and then manipulating the color and then you put it back and you can make a color-free image. If you're good at that sort of thing, more power to you. I would rank my skills in those pieces of software as moderate. So there you have it, a look at color correction at three different price points with three different refractors. I hope you found this interesting and entertaining. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.